Hello, this is Richard Murphy at Tax Research, and I want to talk about transfer pricing. Now, whatever you else you have heard about transfer pricing, let me tell you one thing straight away. It is legal. Most people seem to think there's something desperately dodgy about the term transfer pricing, and it must involve some degree of illegality. It doesn't. It's a completely normal commercial transaction and arrangement that takes place millions of times every day around the world. And that's because transfer pricing occurs whenever two companies who are owned by another company, with each of them being located in different countries, trade with each other. Let's use an example. Let's suppose a UK company, we'll call it ABC, owns a subsidiary company, DEF, which is in South Africa. And let's presume that ABC in the UK owns another company in the USA, which we'll call XYZ. Now, suppose that DEF in South Africa makes a product that XYZ in the USA wants to sell. Now, if the companies were wholly unrelated to each other, in other words, their ownerships were the same, you can be fairly sure that the two will negotiate with each other until a fair price from which both benefit will be obtained. That's called, in the jargon, the arm's length price. It's the price that the market has set by negotiation, and that's believed to be correct and fair for taxation purposes. So, that's the yardstick which transfer pricing is trying to emulate. What actually happens is something quite different, potentially. Because the two companies are owned by ABC in the UK, ABC might decide that it's in its best interest to set a price which is not the market price, and instead sets a price that gives it the lowest overall tax rate. That's when the dodginess that people associate with transfer pricing comes into play. Let me give you an example. Suppose we have a product which is going to be sold by XYZ in the USA for, let's say, $10, and its costs in the States are $2 with regard to that product. Now let's suppose that the cost of making this product in South Africa is $3. So now we have costs in South Africa of $3, we have costs in the States of $2, and we have a sale price in the States of $10, so there's $5 profit to allocate somewhere. Now, that's a good profit rate, but this is an example. And let's assume now that the tax rate in South Africa is 40% and the tax rate in the USA is only 10%. Again, I stress, this is an example. Well, you can see straight away that there's going to be a massive incentive in that case for the group of companies owned by ABC to declare as much of their profit in the States as they can and as little of their profit in South Africa as they can. Suppose all that $5 of profit was declared in South Africa. At 40%, the $5 profit would give rise to a $2 tax bill. If the $5 was all declared in the USA, it would give rise to a tax bill of 50 cents. So clearly, a significant difference, 30% difference, 30% uh, difference of the profit margin. Obviously, a result where South Africa gets no tax and the USA gets all the tax, even if at a lower rate, is unfair to South Africa. It's actually not right for the USA, although they probably aren't complaining too much. Remember, it's always the, company that lose, the country that loses that complains in transfer pricing cases. So what has been established is the arm's length pricing rule. Now, this is endorsed by both the OECD and the United Nations in their double tax treaties between countries and the USA and South Africa have one. And they say the fair price at which goods should be transferred by companies under common ownership between South Africa and the USA should be the arm's length price. That would mean that logically the value within this supply chain should be attributed between the two. Now, then the question comes up, well, how do you do that? It's easy, of course, if there is a simple comparable product. If there were two other companies, one in South Africa and one in the USA, who weren't under common ownership and who were selling this identical product from South Africa to the States, we could go and look at their price list to see if they were really charging it, it and if they were, that could set the arm's length price. Now, that's again the simple idea behind this, and it would work for very straightforward homogenous products for which there's a clear market. 
and that sometimes is true for things like oil and minerals and so on. But when you are talking about a manufactured product which has a brand associated with it, suppose the thing we're talking about is the component that goes into an engine in the USA, um, but is only made for that one particular engine for that one particular company and nobody else makes it, for example, then quite clearly there isn't a comparison to be made. And so then you have to work out how to allocate that profit. Now, the truth is that, that normally this comes down to negotiation. And the negotiation tends to depend upon where is the product sold, clearly. The place where the product is sold to a third party outside the group has to generate some of the profit because they've made the sale. Where are the people engaged who actually make this product? Are there more people in South Africa than in the States? In that case, well, maybe you could argue that South Africa owns a larger part of the profit. Where is the physical assets which actually are used to make this? If there's a factory in South Africa, but only a few computers used in the sales process in the States, then the company might have a much bigger investment in South Africa, and so is entitled to a bigger profit as a result. Of course, you could simply apportion it and say the costs in South Africa were $3, and therefore out of the total profits of $5, $3 should go to the States because the costs in the States were $2, and therefore the profit in the States could be $2. The point I make is that this is not a strict a science. This is an art. This is negotiation. But it is possible for a company to decide to try to do this fairly, honestly and openly. And that would be called tax compliance. And that is what I argue for. And if they do that, then they will want to put everything openly and on record. And therefore people will see that they are playing fair and square and corporately responsibly. That's an option that every com company has. Alternatively, they can try and hide behind every device that is available so that nobody knows what they're doing in each country. They might put tax haven transactions in the way to divert some of the profit into even lower, spaced, lower charged spaces. And they could simply try to disguise what they're doing to all the tax authorities involved. I call that wholly irresponsible. Both options are possible. Transfer pricing is an enormous problem. It's an area which is open to abuse. And the one thing that stops that abuse dead in its tracks is transparency. That's exactly why we believe, I believe, in transparency and promote country by country accounting by multinational corporations so we can see precisely who's declaring what profits where, what tax they're paying on them, and therefore who is likely to be fiddling and who is likely to be playing by the rules. That's what we want. It's easy to achieve. Transparency does it. That's why we need it. Transfer pricing can be tackled for the benefit of everybody in the world.